Welcome to the one within all to another episode of Interverse. They said it couldn't be done, but here we are back to back nights unpacking gigantic research filled episodes. And we're blessed to have Michelle Gibson return to us after her epic first time around on September 20 something. So it's been a couple of months and right now I'm still feeling that discharge of the super strong full moon. So I'm ready to be at the saddle again, even though we just did a huge one last night. Got to say big thanks to Michelle for preparing a PowerPoint to go over some of the topics that I was interested in covering tonight and for just all around being one of the largest champions for like in terms of bulk of data and research accumulated. There's few out there who sourced things back to <laughs> as far back as she has and shown manipulations of our historical narrative based on what we can see with our eyes, the evidence that's out there. Her website, piercingtheveilevolution.com, and her YouTube channel, linked in the episode description. Both of those will be, and also in the live chats. We will be on Rockfin for the second part of this tom uh, topic today, just like normal, and Patreon subscribers will get the upload a little later once I have a shot to do that. But yeah, well, let's, I don't want to talk too much in this intro. There's so much to unpack. So let's welcome Michelle to the show. Thanks for being here. And how are you doing? I'm doing really well. And thanks for the invite back. And thank you for the question uh, that you sent me in advance, because it really helps me focus on putting the presentation together. Um, there is a lot of data on my website, as we found last time. And, you know, knowing which direction to go in can be a challenge sometimes. So it's really helpful that you did that. Yeah, you kind of just have to pick a topic and dig deep into it and then trust that as you pick other topics that might seem random and not connected, you'll start to see how everything is really connected. All these <laughs> his stories lead us to a different tale, which is the my story, the mystery, which is a much more powerful and emboldening tale to start to unravel just how incredibly capable our not even that far back ancestors were and we see it all around us and the things that they built and left behind that we fairly barely understand and the extent that dark forces have gone to basically hijack our timeline and hijack us and hijack the creator for that matter um through us and the truth is just below the surface. And once you start even scratching the surface, the whole narrative falls apart. And I'll be talking about that tonight. Yeah, I've been enjoying catching up <laughs> on your recent videos. One in particular that I'd like to give a nod to, or there's two now, it's going to be a three-part series, you said. Mm -hmm. Getting into the, <laughs> will you introduce that for us, the the uh, Old West and shows and, and uh, candy, production and all kinds of things that are monolithic staples of our current world. Right now I'm working on early radio and television. Um, but I had to start it off with somebody left information. Somebody left me in a comment to take a look at father Eusebio Kino. And he was a Jesuit missionary who was the first rancher in Arizona. Oh boy. And <laughs> you know, that ties back into part one that you're talking about, which is about how the Wild West is is basically fiction. You know, what we've been taught about as being real history isn't. And um, and somebody said, hey, you should look into this guy. He was like the first cowboy. <laughs> and I did. And, um, you know, they get all the accolades and he's got a statue in the U.S. Capitol building and, a, you know, he's the bee's knees. They're working on turning him into a saint <laughs> and you know that's the process that these cultural heroes are that are given to us go through i mean they they become our our heroes but they're not right in circuses they're of, yeah they're part of how this whole taker takeover has taken place the yeah. jesuits are very much in in that mix yeah it's always been um a messiah program Set, set up with uh, certain characters. When we talk about philanthropists, which I think will be an hour or two, that's a really good example how it, it sort of kills two birds with one stone. You get a folk hero out of it and you get an excuse to 
say where all these amazing structures came from, even though when you start to add it up, it just no one person could have produced that much. And that's exactly the process that's been going on. Yeah, over and over again. And then as the um, the, the lies start to get sh shakier in their foundations, then wars happen that destroy things or riots happen that knock out the statues. It's uh, definitely an amazingly well orchestrated constant attack. And that's how you know that there's a, a lie going on because the truth doesn't need defense, but lies need constant maintenance. Exactly. And they, they've told so many lies, they can't keep up with it at all. <laughs> so, so many things that just don't even make sense in what they tell us, like, you know, massive structures going up during the Depression or during World War I or World War II. You know, they've got all their dates are like scrunched together. So they're telling us the Supreme Court building in Washington, Washington D.C. was built between 1932 and 1935. You know, and it's this massive Greco-Roman style building. Massive. And that's so, not even, that's within living memory for some people. That's what's amazing <laughs> that they can even lie about stuff like that. Exactly. So I want to remind people that are tuning in to our RSS feed, just audio only. This is a good episode to pop in the show description or just go to the YouTube for Interverse and find the actual video, because Michelle has prepared images for us to look at, this is the type of story that it really helps to show, not just tell, because a picture in this case is worth many thousands of words when you see the architecture and uh, other other aspects of the historical narrative put images put next to the Wikipedia keepers of knowledge story. Right. Um, and if you can pass on my email address for anybody that would like to get in touch with me. I saw a message from Snake Jones. Um, I'd be happy to leave that. So anybody that wants to follow up with me afterwards can do that. Okay, cool. You don't mind if I put that in the live chat here? I, I don't mind that at all. Please Absolutely. Do. I will do that once we get underway on it, looking at some of your slides. Yeah, I mean, my, my research has grown leaps and bounds from the information people have given me and pointed me at looking um, I started with my own research data points and got to a certain place and then followed up on other people's comments and suggestions. And I'm, I'm just still blown away by the synchronicities of what's coming forward just from that process. Yeah, I was happy to see that you were showing some stuff from my neck of the woods in a couple of your more recent, not super recent, I guess, but since we last talked videos on the short and sweet series, which is all just you emails emails and comments from you people out there pointing Michelle towards backyard mysteries and you got into the Springfield underground and then started looking at other underground complexes beneath cities and it's pretty wild it's pretty wild and how they connect to mansions and stuff out in the country <laughs> yeah definitely. I mean it's like a whole untapped piece of the puzzle about what's actually been going on here I mean to what extent have they been using those tunnels for unimaginable trafficking? Um, yeah. And I'm sure that's been going on. I mean, somebody told me that the Rothschilds are behind a miracle and I couldn't find anything to corroborate that. So I didn't put that in there, but um, because they're well hidden, but wouldn't surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. Well, do you want to get underway on some of the slides here? We may have trouble fitting in all the preparation you did, which is fine. I'd love to just talk to you several times. There's <laughs> no end to interesting things that you would discover. Okay, I'm ready to go whenever you are. Okay, so if you just, when I see that you've pulled up uh, the screen that you want to share, there it is. I'll bring it up and I could even, if it helps, we'll see. I could also make it full, full screen. We'll see how it looks once uh, you've got it full screen there, but yeah. You see that okay? Yeah, we're seeing this great. So one of the first questions you sent me was, who are the odd fellows? And the odd fellows are pretty well hidden in the narrative, but I have encountered them in my research. So when I was studying the seven Salem solar eclipse of 2017, I started my research in Salem, Oregon, which is the state capital, and found a lot of the same kinds of things I'm, I'm finding all over the place. 
Um, but this building, my cat is um, <laughs> bound and determined to be in my space when he's not getting enough attention sometimes. I know okay. how that is. <laughs> so um, this started out as the, like the grand theater in Salem. And the Odd Fellows were credited with having built it. And then later it became one of their lodges. And today it houses retail businesses, offices, and a ballroom. And they rent it out for special events. Um, so this really isn't that much different from other things that we get told about buildings. It's typically Freemasons, but um, the Odd, Odd Fellows get, you know, credit time or two. And I think they're very, very similar in their goals. And what's interesting about the Great Theater, the Grand Theater in Salem, is that you can see where it originally had a tower here and not today. That happened a lot. Yeah, you see that time and time again, uh, sometimes domes removed or spires or uh, especially big bells. Those are often destroyed and taken away. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So there's more than likely a reason they're doing that in terms of disabling whatever energy function the building might have had on the grid system. Um, that would be my guess as to the primary reason they do things like that, but there could certainly be other reasons. Uh, but that that's very typical. They They change the structure of the building, they take towers off, that kind of thing. And another thing that feels good to add is just about the Odd Fellows, which are very, <laughs> I'm looking at their website right now, and they have three tenets of friendship, love, and truth. And under the love tab, it says the historic command of the Odd Fellow is to visit the sick, relieve the distressed, bury the dead, and educate the orphan. That last part definitely sticks out. And then under the truth uh, column, it says, be a part of the history and the mystery. So <laughs> they use they say that they use rituals, symbols, and degrees designed to elevate and improve the character of mankind. Pretty interesting. Exactly. And so they were a secret society running around the same time that the Scottish Rite Freemasons were getting off the ground, uh, the same time that the the Knights of Pythias were getting started, which was during the Civil War. And I'll be getting into a number of things about the Civil War in this presentation tonight in both this part and then in the in part two. Uh, and that was something that I had chance on my notes to tell you is that when you have an, a command like visit the sick, relieve the distressed, bury the dead, and educate the orphan, who are they talking about? And with all of my research, I've come to the conclusion that there was a mud flood of some kind. Um, the 19th century was a reset century when they were digging a lot of the infrastructure out and then making it serviceable again. I think we were a mess. I think humanity was a mess. I think the elites were probably doing pretty well, living well, you know, kind of like they've been doing these days. Um, but I think in general, humanity was not in good shape. And they were bringing in a lot of distilleries and breweries during that time, like starting around the 1830s, um, especially they were setting up shops, setting up the financial system. But why were there so many orphans? Where were all these kids coming from? And um, I think there's a number of reasons for that. And that's where you get into repopulating the earth and inventoriums and orphan trains and, and things like that. Now, I also want to add some word magic that's in that Odd Fellows creed, if you will. It says, relieve the distress, the distressed. All right. So one thing that to relieve somebody could mean is to take something from them. I relieved you of your possessions, your goods. And the word distressed, if you go back to one of my favorite dictionaries, you can find online Webster's 1828 dictionary. <laughs> It's the act of distraining, the taking of any personal shadow from a wrongdoer to answer a demand or procure satisfaction for a wrong committed. So 
A thing taken by distraining, which is a synonym for distress, is that which is seized to procure satisfaction. And then there's a whole rabbit hole that go down, like satisfaction has legal connotations in terms of what we're talking about, taking of personal chattel from a wrongdoer. It could very well mean relieving the distressed as in taking ownership of the the districted people. Districted people, it, it's like stra- putting them through a strainer. So we have the District of Columbia. It has to do with um, numbering the people and own, ownership type of word. Uh, it's sorting and separating by social security numbers are a, a form of distraining. So relieve the dist- distress. It also means in an occult sense, especially going back to the time when these orders were more highly active, it's t- it's talking about also potentially talking about taking ownership of the numbered people in some way or t- relieving them of their possessions. Very interesting. That's a really good point, Chance. And um, the other thing with that, you know, command that they have is that they make it sound like they're doing good, which is like exactly what you're saying. But they they have a tendency to wrap up their activities in nice sounding words. <laughs> So we don't know what they're actually up to. Um, so that that would make a lot of sense to me. So this order was founded in this. The fasci. <laughs> exactly. Two fasci. Uh, the American order was founded in, say, 1842, 1843, during that time. A lot going on in our historical narrative around that time. And uh, I really think the official kickoff of the New World Order timeline was 1851 at the Crystal Palace Exhibition. But there was a lot going on up to the decades up to that time and after. So that whole 19th century was very busy (laughs) in terms of all the things they're telling us was going on during that time to build this new country. Um, And I think they were actually reclaiming. What was already there yes yes you've done some really good work to point that out and that even uh indigenous tribes had that no one has ever heard of have uh seats on the united nations yeah there's there's a lot wrapped up in that and um i'm gonna kind of move to my next slide but um sure uh, just a couple more comments and one is uh you took a picture for me of, I guess, a plaque or a bench near yeah, you. It was a, it's a, it was a bench at, at a park. It was Odd Fellows. It was like a memorial bench or something like that at the yeah. Botanical Garden. Yeah. And then I came across an Odd Fellows Cemetery in my, uh, my my last research for the Breads and Circuses, Bread and Circuses, because Robert. Ripley was buried in the Odd Fellows Cemetery in California. And um, I just really think all of that, um, the circus stuff and the freak show stuff and the, you know, believe it or not, and they want to just give us all of this really, these really odd details of all of these things all over the earth. That was just part of the distraction um, to keep us focused away (laughs) from what's really important in our lives. They want us distracted so we don't see what's going on around us. Um, they've they been have working a Ripley's, on... believe it or not, in Branson, Missouri, 30 minutes from here. I remember going to as a kid. And they would even show you giants and stuff. And just be like, oh, look, poke you in the eye. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's all part of this gigantic sen- sensational illusion that they're trying to take our attention away from other things. And um, they're very good at it, unfortunately. Yeah. They, they inserted a virtual world right at the beginning of their reset. And um, that series is going through exactly what that was. And what I'm working on right now about radio and television, it'll go even deeper into that. Right. People are kind of flipping out over Facebook becoming meta and like, don't go into the metaverse. But uh, there's already been a metaverse. <laughs> There has been, but it's it's never been like in your face like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, now they're it's very in your face. In, it's been in the periphery. You know, we don't think of, you know, 
television radio being virtual reality, but it is. And look at how pervasive that is. <laughs> exactly. And the information that forms a worldview in people's minds in the collective, that is just as much of a metaverse as a, a virtual world that you could go into with Oculus Rift goggles. And so now we're at that point in history where you make a conscious choice. Do you want to live a virtual life or do you not want to live a virtual life? And I would, I would choose no. Right. <laughs> you know, I don't want to give up my God given right as a human being to enter into somebody else's version of reality. That's, you know, designed to take my energy. So that's kind of where we are with it. Now that we know about it, are we going to make that choice for ourselves? And should we make that choice for ourselves? Because it's all part of a manipulation of our perception. Yeah, worldview warfare, I think, is the really the only kind of warfare that the elites wage against us. And then once our worldviews are sufficiently warped and poisoned to the point where we'll just kill each other or kill ourselves, then that level of warfare exists. But all that really is done is the wolves pulled over our eyes about who we are and, and our relationship to, to life. Right. You know, and that's the value of the great awakening that's happening right now, you know? So, um, you know, thank you for the work you're doing and, you know, all the people that are watching tonight, um, it starts with us and I I'll go into the next segment of this so you can see at a deeper level, the kinds of things that I'm talking about because the deception goes very, very deep. <laughs> yeah. And everything's connected. I think you're about to go into sanitary fairs, if I'm not wrong. That's correct. And that's just one layer of the onion beginning to program people into the whole germ theory idea and that there's invisible boogeymen ready to kill them. To a certain extent, but it's also about the American civil war. And did it actually happen the way that we're told that it did? Right. And I don't the, think it the, did. <laughs> the world <laughs> fairs were about that too. Um, exactly. Yeah. Shaping the, shaping the story. So this was a subject that uh, one of my uh, commenters pointed me towards, and I had not heard of them before, but as soon as I started looking up the information, I'm like, wow. So sanitary fairs were held by Northerners. So we're told by the, uh, during the American Civil War as a fundraiser for the many needs of Union soldiers, including health. These sanitary fairs had everything, including the majestic temporary buildings that were said to have been built for them, just like the World Fairs, only to be torn down afterwards. And while these were not as elaborate as the big exhibitions, like the one in Chicago and, you know, Philadelphia, the ones that we hear about, St. Louis, they were still something in and of themselves. So there was this agency called the United States Sanitary Commission. It was said to have been formed to raise money and that these fairs were fundraising events held to support this agency. It was a private relief agency with the mission of supporting the sick and wounded soldiers of the Union Army and it was created by federal legislation on June 18th of 1861. Now this is Henry Whitney Bellows, and he was the planner of the United States Sanitary Commission, and he was its only president from 1861 to 1878, and he was a Unitarian clergyman. You'll see a lot of the same names circulating as I go through this. In addition to planning and organizing the Sanitary Commission, Henry Whitney Bellows was an organizer of the Union League Club of New York, along with Frederick Law Olmsted, George Templeton Strong, and Walcott Gibbs. This was a private social club for wealthy men that opened in New York City in 1863, which would have been two years into the Civil War, where pro-union men could come together to cultivate a profound national devotion and strengthen a love and respect for the union. It became the most exclusive men's club in Manhattan and perhaps in the nation. And this particular location of the Union League Club was said to have been built on the northeast corner of Fifth Avenue and 39th Street between 1879 and 1881. 
Now let's take a moment and just look at those pictures. <laughs> they want now, us to believe tall, that was look, what is up with that really tall <laughs> spire or pole on the top of it. That's one thing. Um, Antiquity really of spire, some kind. Yeah. Uh, you've got all the features of this same architecture you see all over Europe, actually all over the United States. Most the of it's brick. gone. It's been torn, torn down. You've got the colonnades here. You know, we're taught that's Greco-Roman, but you find these types of colonnades all over the place. I know this type of, um, I can't think of the architectural term for it, um, the gables here. And then on the inside, you've got these beautiful vaulted ceilings and ornate designs and, and huge halls. <laughs> you know, this isn't, this isn't proportionally matching here, <laughs> you know, with this little cluster of three men here or the two men here. I mean, that's a huge building. Um, so that was the most exclusive men's club in, um, a private club for wealthy men in New York for its time. Henry Whitney Bellows was also involved in the organizing of the Century Association in New York City, which was founded in 1847 and incorporated in 1857. So again, those dates are kind of falling around the same time as like the Odd Fellows with 1842-1843. The Century Association was a private social arts and dining club. So this is different from the last one that I mentioned, the Union League Club. And um, this was uh, the headquarters of the United States Sanitary Commission. And um, its members included Calvert Vaugh and Frederick Law Olmsted. And I'm going to be going into Olmsted in just a moment. And they're credited with Central Park, among other things. Beaux Arts architects like Carrera and Hastings, McKim, Mead, and White. And you see these names come up over and over again when you're looking at the details of this um, architecture from the, the time period that we're talking about. The first executive secretary of the United States Sanitary Commission was Frederick Law Olmsted. And most people know him as a famous landscape architect, but among other things, before the Civil War, he was commissioned by the New York Times to start on an extensive research journey in the American South and Texas between 1852 and 1857. So he sent these dispatches um, in three books, and this is they were all published in one book um, from like, I think the first one was A Journey in the Seaboard Slave States, which was published in 1856. A Journey Through Texas was published in 1857, and A Journey in the Back Country in the winter of 1853 and 1854, which was published in 1860. This is all right before the Civil War. And they were published in this book here that's showing. Um, so he, Olmsted was a journalist before he became the landscape architect. And these are all red flags for me because I've come to believe from my research that publications like these and the next one I'm going to show you are indicative of some kind of setting the stage in seeding this new historical narrative into our consciousness by the ones that are actually responsible for the hijack of the original positive civilization that actually built all the infrastructure. And there are a number of examples of this type of thing where these, um, these people are going in and writing their firsthand accounts of what they saw, and then they become, you know, New York Times bestseller kind of things back in the day. And then I have the same question about another founder of the United States Sanitary Commission and the Union League Club, and that was George Templeton Strong. So he was involved in, in both, and he was a lawyer and diarist, and he had an over 2,000-page 2, diary that was said to have been found in the 1930s that contained his personal account of life in the 19th century particularly between 1835 and 1875, including the American Civil War. I find it interesting, too, that sanitary wasn't even a word before they came up with the Sanitary Commission. It, it really on that word. Mm -hmm. 
it really makes you wonder. And this was said to have been based on the British Sanitary Commission, and that was how Florence Nightingale got her start and during the Crimean War. And that was in the period of time right before this. So that would have been like the decade right before the time period that we're talking about in the United States. So the United States Sanitary Commission operated 30 soldiers' homes, lodges, and rest houses for Union soldiers that were traveling or wounded, most of which closed right after the war, and they were responsible for setting up and staffing hospitals during the war. So this is what looks to be the mud-flooded building of Camp Nelson, which was one of their camps. And you can kind of see you know, the signs of the mud flood are, are here, you know, where you've got the the unlevel ground. It starts to go up and then looks like it is covering what might be entrances or windows here. You know, it's just this really uneven appearance, like there's something more going on. And why would you build that way in the first place if there wasn't something going on there? And then the, the road here looks pretty muddy or dirty. And a few guys working around here. So just lots of questions about that. But I, I really have questions about the next building, which is the pension building. <laughs> <laughs> Take oh a gosh. look at that. Guess when they built that? I think it says 1887, uh, but you're, there's a little yeah. stream yard bubble there over it. You can click hide on that and it'll go away without stopping your there share, though. Thanks. All right. Said to have been built in 1887. To With horses, process, I guess. <laughs> to process <laughs> and administer all of the pension requests from veterans. Yeah, because the reconstruction process they tell us about after everything got obliterated in the civil war that wasn't too expensive or anything so they just went ahead and built stuff like this too to pay you, you for get, pensions you know you get the size of it the size of the columns Unreal. compared to the people in it um you know you've got these colonnaded levels going on here you know they remind me of the aqueduct in segovia spain or seville spain that's so famous <laughs> with the different archways you've got a fountain in here you got a fountain out here. Um, you know, this is this is the one of so many examples of the types of architecture that we're looking at and saying, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and really, until the internet age, we didn't have the resources to go and check all this stuff up, you know, and that's how the story got perpetuated. Oh, okay. Well, they built this in 1887. Yeah. All right. Pretty. Without even questioning whether that was possible, given what else they tell us in the narrative, which is that we didn't have that kind of technology. Yeah. It's just circular logic type <laughs> stuff where the fact that other things that look like that are said to have been built at that time means that, oh, well, I guess it makes sense that this thing I'm looking at is said to have been built at that time. It's a big self referential web of deceit right and unfortunately it's worked up until recent years because they've had control of the sources of information and the narrative so thank yeah, and the inside the of the building is just incredible though to look at i mean you mentioned the scale of people next to the columns but i imagine if you called up an architect firm or construction company right now and sent them this picture and said can you build me one of these they would be like no <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all I see is <clears throat> a particle board and uh, plywood going up in my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cheap. <laughs> Whenever they build a new coffee stand or whatever. I think Dunkin' Donuts thing, went in not too long ago. So in the chat, they're talking a little bit about how <clears throat> a sanitary or san the sanitary commission sounds like sanatoriums. And of course, that's a big key to the whole thing where people are being sent for re-education uh, potentially. But the word sanitary or sanity, sorry, the one that's the root word to these made up new words that they gave us, sanatorium and sanitary commission. Sanity refers to being sound of mind. And I think that the word sound is key there. That's part of uh, what was taken away from the equation that made people not sound in their mind anymore. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, they are telling us a lot with, with the roots of words in our everyday language. Um, and I'm going to go into that a little bit later on in this presentation as far as electrical energy terms go. But um, yeah, I, I think there's a whole story in there. The etymology is not a particular area that I know a lot about. I you know, just know a lot to ask questions. So um, let me get through the sanitary fair part and then I'll, I'll get out a screen share and, and field some of those questions. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll try not to derail. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> so interesting. I appreciate that. So um, with regards to the occurrence of the sanitary fairs themselves, they were said to have started out as local fundraising events to benefit the sanitary commission and that they grew more and more elaborate and that the fairs and the exhibitions and bazaars were organized and run by civilians to raise the funds for the sanitary commission for food, clothing, bandages, and other supplies for both military hospitals and soldiers in the field. So again, during, you know, the civil war, where, where are they getting all the wherewithal to do this? You know, first question, <laughs> if everything's in disarray, how are they organizing these elaborate festivities? And, and I'm going to get into some examples of that. The first sanitary fair was a two-day mammoth fair in Lowell, Massachusetts in February of 1863. And the largest of the sanitary fairs was the Northwestern Soldiers' Fair in Chicago from October 27th of 1863 to November 7th of 1863. And that was said to have raised close to $100,000 for the cause. So here's one example. And again, for some of this stuff, it's it's really hard to find data to support, you know, looking for a specific example, you know, I'll see a reference to something and then it's hard to find um, more information. So I couldn't find any photos or illustrations of the Northwestern Soldiers Fair in Chicago, but I did find an article saying that there was said to have been a three mile long or five kilometer long parade of militiamen bands, political leaders, representatives of local organizations, organizations, and a contingent of farmers with crops, with carts full of crops. Um, in 1863 in Chicago during the Civil War. So it says here, 100 wagons brimming with farm produce rolling along unpaved streets with army musicians playing military airs and marching groups of flag-waving children singing patriotic songs. Spectators jostling to catch glimpses of a carriage draped with tattered Confederate army flags captured by federal troops. I mean, it's like, say what? <laughs> it sounds like what ancient Rome would do, the, the big parades they would have. You know, again, is that even real? <laughs> Um, you know, it's just a highly questionable narrative even then, you know, and we're still getting a lot of the same kind of stuff now. Yeah. Where's all that extra produce coming from? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, they're in wartime and they've got all this bounty. Um, and then the Harper's Weekly, um, this is, has an article about the first metropolitan fair in New York. Um, it ended up being held between April 4th and April 23rd of 1864, and it raised over a million dollars and was the largest sanitary fair ever. Now, I thought this was kind of interesting with the Metropolitan Fair. They could purchase a souvenir like the Book of Bubbles. Okay, so <laughs> the Book of Bubbles, a contribution to the New York Fair in aid of the Sanitary Commission, New York. And then you get to this I found describing it as nonsense verses with illustrations. And it was a contrib contribution to the New York Fair by members of the Sanitary Commission. You know, and again, what's this? <laughs> <laughs> there's a gesture in the imagery and i find that fascinating because there's to me there's this story of the the clown is always right next to the crown the clown and the crown and, and then going even from 
one language to another, there's often a phonetic switch between R and L that happens. So mm -hmm. <laughs> when we think about bread and circus as the it is the crown that's putting on that's doing the clowning. They're they're clowning us. Our entire civilization is a big prank. Right. Right. And and they're telling us that, I think, with this, especially since you point that out. That's a really good point about what's going on here. You know, they're just pulling the wool over our eyes. And again, I don't think the human population was very functional during the 19th century because of, you know, everything that happened with the mud flood. And then, you know, the adult humans that were there were, had plenty of alcohol, plenty to drink. It was yeah. becoming a part of the culture already. And then and, you see in old cartoons when a character is drunk, there's bubbles coming out of their mouth. That's like a cartoon way to depict drunkenness. Yeah. So, you know, there's again, there's a lot of things hiding in plain sight. And you really have to look at it critically and think about it critically. Um, because on the surface, so, you know, it's be like, so what? But there really is meaning to all of this. And um not just here, but in a lot of other things where they're telling us. I mean, they have to tell us what they're doing, but they haven't been telling us that they're telling us. And this is one of the ways they think they've been getting away with it. I don't think they will get away with it, but that's how they've been skirting the requirement. Okay. So... The Great Northwestern Sanitary Fair that was held from October 27th to November 7th of 1865 was the last sanitary fair. And it was said to have raised $270,000 for sick and wounded soldiers. And the speakers at this one included Generals Ulysses, Ulysses S. Grant, William T. Sherman, and Joseph Hooker. And the exhibits at the fair were said to include the bell from Jefferson Davis's plantation, and he was the president of the Confederacy. The clothing both men were wearing at the 1858 Abraham Lincoln Stephen Douglas debates about slavery. And General Grant's horse was raffled off as a fundraiser. So, again, you know, would you expect to find that kind of festive atmosphere with? all of the big raffles and all the big names there from the civil war. Um, does that sound normal <laughs> or, you know, it just seems, it seems very strange. It does sound staged. <laughs> yep. Staged is a good word. They're putting a show on. And another interesting point about this last fair in Chicago is that it took place after Lincoln's assassination, which took place in April of 1865. So they had this commemorative medallion for the Chicago Sanitary Fair um, that was specially minted for it in 1865. And then um, the Civil War was already ended on April 9th of 1865. Uh, right before Lincoln's assassination. So that last fair was held after it was all over with. And so again, I, I asked the question, I mean, where did the U.S. Sanitary Commission and its volunteers have the wherewithal to both construct the buildings for and pull off these extraordinarily lavish and festive undertakings against the backdrop of national war and suffering? Or was it actually a private front comprised of the very same people who organized and were prominent members of the private membership clubs of the day to set up the new historical narrative for the reset to explain, among other things, how infrastructure came into and left existence. I have to, I have to make a comment here. If you go back one slide to that seal for the sanitary commission. Okay. With this the blue one? background. Oh, this one. Yeah. You see this angelic being coming down. <laughs> to me, that's like a call sign of a particular type of entity that's encoded into the language and the mythology. And it's a, you can connect angels, aliens, jinn, 
seraphim, all these things can be etymologically linked when you study. And the next picture that you showed was a lamp, which is a vessel often meant to symbolize the same class of being or the jinn more specifically. I mean, even the word Shriners who take a lot of their symbolism from the Middle East, which is where the concept of jinn comes from in terms of that word and the lamp, their Shriners after the 33rd degree and uh, these beings like in the previous picture are shining ones referred to as shining ones shriners shiners very interesting yeah and you've got aladdin's lamp story um but another thing that's interesting to point out is this uh, what this canon is doing here is kind of pointing down but then you have two little kids on this side orphans perhaps so you've got more orphans going on here So um, let me go ahead and stop here for questions. Yeah. <laughs> Before I go on. <laughs> well, there's sure a lot of amazing stuff being said in the chat. I found it an interesting subject that might be worth you checking into later. And I'm guessing Snake Jones is going to email you, but mm -hmm. he was making comments about being part of the team that demoed the Union Trust building in downtown St. Louis. And the company he worked for went bankrupt because they underbid the job because it was so difficult to actually tear it down. because It was so well constructed. And there were Griffin lions on the building. And he said, this is the interesting comment here. Underneath the Griffins or underneath something is a Masani level roof. He peeled off the roof to discover a glass ceiling. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So that might be, uh, hopefully he emails you and that might be something worth looking into, but aren't there, do you know anything about union trust buildings in other cities? I know there's one in, or was one in uh, Philadelphia too. And you know, in, ter in terms of this massive colossal masonry, that was all over. Yeah. If that's what you mean. Yeah. So that organization doesn't ring a bell. That might be another one worth uh, investigating, I guess. Yeah, I just found it all interesting that all of these same elite people were part of the same social clubs. And I really think they were doing all the planning for this fake story that they gave us. And that if the Civil War did, in fact, take place at all, it was to destroy the original infrastructure like starports and things like that. Because they did. I mean, we hear that all the time. You know, during the Civil War, Fort Sumter was bombarded and all of these star forts, or it gave a cover for how they came into existence and they built the forts for the civil war, for example. So it, you know, it's a cover story either way. Yeah. Do you think that there's any, um, have you seen any evidence that there's some non-human or beyond human influence with the, in fact, the way the narrative is shaped and the sort of lockstep nature of it all. I, I do. You know, they, they're they not human. I think they found a way to incarnate in human form to do what they've been doing, you know, that we're seeing, you know, in a painful way now with all the things that are happening in the world. But it was their plan for a very long time to do this. Um, thankfully, we're waking up. And, uh, and that needs to happen because, you know, the threat to humanity is a serious one. And we have to give our consent. And they, they don't have our consent because they've been lying to us. And they've gone through, you know, mind control and all this other stuff, um, programming and conditioning us not to see what's really there or to question what's right in front of our eyes. Um, a lot of gaslighting going on these days. But, you know, they don't have our consent. And so, you know, we just have to have an open mind and start to question the narrative. Because they can do anything they want to with the narrative. But when you really start looking at the details and you start looking at the, you know, the solidity of the architecture. Or could they have built this when they said they did? You know, those are all factors serious factors to look at just because they said they built something in a certain year doesn't mean they did. <laughs> you 
it means they were well organized and got all the paperwork done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's when buildings were found dead more than built. The free masonry. Right. Always get a right. kick out of that joke. It's a gift that keeps on giving. But so another question I have for you. Um, what is a bigger topic on your agenda right now to tackle for the near future? Any larger forum presentations in the works that you can speak about? Well, um, I'm finishing up, I'm going to be finishing up part three of the Shapers of the News Narrative. Um, it probably will lead to a four. Um, I think I need to delve a little bit into computers and video games because it's all connected. Um, and I've already actually done a lot of the research on that, so it shouldn't take me as long to do the research for that part four. Um, another thing that I want to do is, as soon as I have a chance, is to really look more deeply into the Great Lakes of not only the United States, but also the Great Lakes region of Africa, because there is a Great Lakes region of Africa, call them the same thing. And um, that's been on my mind for a while to do a deep dive into both of those places because they've just sold us so many lies about our history. And um, this was a worldwide civilization. So it's on every continent. <laughs> My mind is going in a couple different directions. It's like, do I talk about non-humans or do I talk about babies and orphans? I think I'm gonna go with the latter uh, for the next question. Because before we got on the air, I was telling you a little bit about this big, placenta research episode that we got into last night and one thing that we see in common with this previous era is uh potentially artificially lab-grown human beings right that uh, i wonder because of the infertility going on right now if we're seeing the preparations being laid for another exact same role reset rollout type of scenario they may be laying the found have been laying the foundations for it but again i'm gonna i'm gonna just hold out hope and that that's not going to happen that it's not going to happen that way they planned have they planned that i have no doubt you know and when you first started talking the first thing that came to mind was think of the movie the matrix as a documentary you know in that scene you see at the beginning with the the human forms with the you know, things in their head. Um, and that gets into the next part of what I want to talk about. So let me go ahead and, and do that so we can get that in this first hour. Oh, sure. Sure. Um, because it actually, it touches on that. You sent me about five really good questions and I, I got <laughs> through about three of them and I'm like, okay, this will be good. <laughs> um, let me find my, where I want to be. Okay. So, um, I did a, a deep dive into looking at the earth as a circuit board, which I absolutely believe that it was. Um, and I think we're being told in our everyday language what the function was of specific infrastructure on the earth, which was arranged as a circuit board for the once free energy generating electromagnetic grid system of the ancient advanced civilization all over the surface of the earth. And I believe this existed up until recent times, and we're still using much of the enduring and sophisticated infrastructure of this advanced civilization in the present day. You know I mean, I, I think the energy companies and everybody are getting their, um, have gotten rich <laughs> off of ancient technology. And I think the original civilization was destroyed by a, a deliberately caused cataclysm within the last couple of hundred years um, and that most of the incredible infrastructure has been deliberately destroyed ever since then and into the present day. Um, so again, I just, this is just a picture of a circuit to give you a comparison of what I think these buildings that we're talking about were actually placed specifically at certain points for a, a reason within this circuitry system. And here's a good picture of what I think happened. Um, some kind of mud flood scenario that could have been caused any number of ways. It could have been frequency weapons. They could have been direct 
energy weapons. They could have been nuclear weapons. Um, it could have been an earthquake. And even today, um, earthquakes at a high enough magnitude will cause liquefaction. So you can see pictures of that or videos of that on YouTube. And um, I absolutely believe that that the original civilization built all the rail systems. So you see that here, you know, they're the mules pulling along whatever these guys are on. Um, and they're just trying to get it dug out, I think, until they can get it restarted. And I think, again, I think that was going on during the 1900s or 1800s and maybe even into the 1900s. So I have a interesting theory to throw your way that is kind of new for me anyway. A recent guest I had on, Benjamin Balderson, who is very deep into alchemy and electric universe theory, mm -hmm. looking at sun and moon as a anode cathode system, looking at nature as a giant series of galvanic battery cells nested within each other like a fractal. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we realized, this was in um, the members only section, so some people listening might not have heard this yet, but he has this machine called the AquaCure, which is a uh, creates a type of hydrogenated gas that seems to have healing properties. And it does this with an electrolysis process that to maybe cut a long story short, short electrolysis is the same thing that would occur if you were to plug a cell, a galvanic cell or a battery into a hard charge. So his theory, what we kind of came to in our conversation was that this idea of Ragnarok, where at the end of Ragnarok, the humans that are left literally have to dig themselves out of the mud, might be the result of some sort of natural or maybe unnatural, who knows, but what isn't natural if you really think about nature as all of existence, uh, electrolysis, where our realm is metaphorically like God plugged in his phone, <laughs> like some sort of charge is put through the entire system to Re reboot in a way, but what happens here with the AquaCure machine and with electrolysis is it a sludge, a muddy sludge is generated by the process that doesn't, it's kind of mysterious where it even comes from. None of the materials that you put into the device to make the gas go anywhere, no weight is lost, but the sludge is generated. And our thinking was that it could be a large scale electrolysis event that led to a mud flood, a liquid liquefaction and increase of ground in the realm. And there's even old spiritual scriptures about this, like Zoroastrian texts about the gods giving mankind more land because they were take, they were too crowded. And so maybe there's something to that in the sense of the earth being alive and growing at certain times, or like the rings of a tree expanding. You know, that's certainly as good an explanation as I've heard of how this could have happened because it was all over the world. Um, I guess my only thought is I really have come to believe that whoever was responsible for this takeover um, did this deliberately. So, you know, they could have found some way to plug into the existing grid system to cause that effect. But they, but cause it, something caused it and something was right there shovel ready to start digging everything out and restart everything. And so I, I, I think that's think a great of it like We could even be seeing um, just like how sort of sorceress priests might've been able to predict an eclipse and then scare all the tribesmen because look, you aren't pleasing God. So he took the sun away, but they just knew it was going to happen because they've been paying attention for a long time. We could be looking at something along those lines where a group that were keeping knowledge knew that something was going to happen and took advantage of it, maybe even want us to believe they have the power to do something like that to us when maybe really they were just, like I said, taking advantage of a natural cycle. These are just ideas because I noticed that with the clown crown, <laughs> they often have, uh, they often bluff, you know, they, they're less powerful than they seem many times because of the fact that all of their 
all of their resources come from our consent and are doing the work for them. Yeah. You know, it's a really good question, really good hypothesis. They did something, something happened. And whatever came in does not have humanity's best interest at heart. That's whatever true. was going on on the surface. I know I, I see this original civilization as being in a high con high level of consciousness, uh, unity consciousness. Um, I see it as being very benevolent. Um, saying that, how did we get to this point? And, you know, could there have been points of entry when this was going on, you know, with, like you say, the, the priest class or whatever, um, where either information was voluntarily given or, you know, unconsciously given that abetted the, the ones doing this. Uh, but I, I definitely think that this has been done deliberately and the, where we're, where we are right now in history is where we've got front row seats to what they had planned playing out. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's why I say, I, I just have to hold on to a belief that they're not going to get away with what they've done. And that's why I'm not, yeah, we might be in the middle of another reset or an attempted reset. But I think there's other forces at work that are a counterforce to that and that it's not a done deal. Um, and, and part of it does involve the awakening of people to what's actually been going on here. I think so, too. I think no matter what it looks like right now, uh, we have the ability to survive anything if we recognize our connection to source. and don't let the fear poison our worldview and keep us from acting in a way that is in harmony with life because it's very simple that nature is full of opportunity it's just our perspective that's limited us down to like oh i've got to depend on these systems to uh survive i can't i got to go to the big rectangle building to get my food for the day but michelle we're at a good point maybe to mosey over to the second part and okay go through some of the um, information on the great philanthropist that you've got in blog posts. But before I move us over there, remind everybody your website, your, and uh, your YouTube channel is called Michelle Gibson. Is that correct? Yes. Um, Michelle Gibson. And if you type in the word more, so it'll come right up. And the, um, my website is piercing the veil of illusion.com. And then I'm on a new platform called unguruyourlife.com. Unguru Your that's just getting started. Yeah, I'm going to have to look into that platform. That's new for me, but I love the name. Mm -hmm. So Thank whenever we good. switch over, I'm going to play uh, some music and a graphic, and there'll be a countdown timer. So you guys will have a little more than three minutes if you want to move over and continue watching the show. Those of you who are on YouTube and Facebook, um, if anybody's on Facebook, looks like we got two Facebook likes. That's amazing. <laughs> anyway, the good stuff on that second part will be, yeah, kicking off really soon. And of course, all of this research that Michelle's going to be going over with us is available through her channel and her website. So if you're really motivated and want to go deeper with what she's uncovered, it's all there for you with or without the rock fence second hour, but it'll be fun to continue asking questions and making connections with Michelle. The music I've got lined up is by Norbs. Again, I picked the same artist as I did last night because I really like what he does and he plays, puts his music in 432. <laughs> Practically at the point where I just don't even want to listen to anything that isn't tuned to 432. So if anyone knows the easy way to convert your entire hard drive of music into 432 easily, let me know. I'd be interested. <laughs> Uh, and while I still have everybody on the YouTube side, I want you to know that I do divination counseling sessions with people using tarot and I Ching. You can hit me up, chance at interversepodcast.com through email or on Telegram. And sound healing. Get your sanity back, sound of mind. <laughs> we do this with tuning forks and even remotely. The sessions are very powerful and prove that electrically we're all connected through the ether and that separation is one of the biggest illusions pushed on us constantly divide and conquer. That's always been the game. Right. But, but yeah, Michelle, thank you again. I'm 
enjoying this. The first hour really flew by. Yes, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Awesome. All right, we will see you guys on the other side.